Hi Reddit, my name is Isabel and I live in the Pacific Northwest, in the great green state of Washington to be exact. One of my New Year's resolutions for 2020 was to lose the extra weight I had accumulated during my first pregnancy, weight that had sapped my confidence and left me feeling kind of dumpy. My husband always told me he didn't mind, that he loved me no matter what, but I minded. It might sound a little trad wife of me, but I want to look my best for him, just like he looks his best for me. But the problem is, I've never ever enjoyed that vibe that seems to hang in the air at co-ed gyms. Some places have members that seem to care only about hooking up or ogling each other, while some female-only gyms are so underfunded that they just aren't worth going to. So I took up hiking. I always figured the outdoors would be super good for my mental health, and I'd gone for walks in the woods as part of fighting off the postnatal depression, which was very effective at doing so. I remember how excited I was, driving out to a sporting goods store to pick up a snug pair of hiking boots, along with a lot of colorful waterproof gear, mostly in lilac, my favorite color. It felt like the start of something wonderful. I was already posting an R ultralight, asking for advice on specialist hiking gear, and I could not wait to report back on my progress. But my first serious solo hike in the woods was set to be anything but relaxing or uplifting, and it left me with a greater respect for nature's wrath than I ever thought was possible. My husband and I arranged for him to look after the baby while I drove out to Olympic National Forest for an afternoon of hiking. I went swimmingly for about an hour or two as I pushed myself up hills, feeling my thighs burning and trembling when they felt the relief of a downslope. It felt amazing, exhilarating, and truly uplifting, at least until I took a tumble. I think my boot caught a rock or something, hidden among the earth, but whatever happened, I found myself rolling around in the dirt beneath me, holding onto my ankle as I grimaced in pain. I found I could still put a little weight on it, so it couldn't have been worse than a strain, but it still hurt like the devil. That's when the strangest, most adorable thing happened to me. A crow, a little calling black feathered guy, flew down from a tree landed on a tree stump nearby and began to flap his wings. He was doing little jumps, flapping all the while, calling his little head off like he was singing for his supper. He had saw me take a fall and was flying down to see if I was okay. I mean, that's what it seemed like, because as soon as I said, like, yeah, I'm fine, just scared myself is all, he quieted down and began eyeing me with each of the tiny black pebbles set in his skull. With my ankles still aching a little, I picked myself up, said goodbye to my new crow buddy, then began to limp back towards my car. What happened next seemed like the sweetest thing ever. My new little crow buddy actually followed me. Yep, he followed me. So close, too, just making sure I was okay as I was shuffling back to my car. He flew from tree to tree, always sticking close, calling every so often, just to let me know he was still there to watch over me. It was honestly such a boost. The fall has really rocked my confidence, and to note that nature had its own way of being so kind, so compassionate, it really picked me up at a time I absolutely needed it. However, it wasn't long until my ankle began to really swell up from the sprain, and obviously with the swelling came an increased amount of pain. Now, I know this might sound crazy, but that intense pain and my inability to properly escape it, it brought back the memories of childbirth. And as I sat there on a fallen log, taking the weight off my ankle, I found myself bursting into tears. And just like something out of a Disney movie, down swooped my little crow friend, who began a same little song and dance of concern. It made my heart swell at the time, it really did. It really was like a Disney story something, the crying princess and her little bird friend. But then, in what I thought was a beautiful moment, I heard something that made my blood run cold. Something was moving through the trees about a hundred yards up the slope. Something huge. Something that drooled when it saw me sitting on that fallen log. It was a grizzly bear. Fresh out of hibernation. And it was obviously starving. What I thought was my little crow friend began its song and dance again. Only this time, it was intensely more frenzied than it had been before. I thought it was a warning. I couldn't have been more wrong. 
The bear began a rapid descent down the slope towards me, panting as it hurtled through the trees. But I was ready for it. I had managed to pick up the most potent bear mace I could get my hands on, one of the things my new Reddit hiking buddies had insisted I purchased. I pulled it out, flipped off the safety catch, and sprayed a huge mist of bright yellow mace into the air in front of me. I was terrified, convinced that it just wouldn't work for some reason, that the bear would just be too hungry, would take the pain and tear me limb from limb right there on the forest floor. But it worked. It actually worked. As soon as the grizzly hit that stinging yellow miss, it stopped dead in its tracks, blinked its eyes before it began to violently sneeze and retch as the mace began to take effect. I didn't bother to stick around and revel in the victory. I mean, who would? I just ran. Ran until my ankle felt like it was about to explode, but thankfully, some small act of God's mercy led me right back to my car, and somehow I actually made it home. I lived to be able to tell this tale. But when I did, I did a little research. And what I thought was my little crow friend, what had seemed like a Disney-style friendship between beauty and beast, was anything but that. As it turns out, crows and bears have something of a special relationship. Often upon sighting a wounded or infirm animal, a crow will fly down from a tree and call like the devil. Not out of any kind of concern, but in order to direct a large predator, often a bear, onto the wounded creature. Once the bear had finished chowing down, the crow can eat the scraps. And that day in the woods could have very well ended with me being the scraps. Mount Fuji is one of the highest volcanoes in all of Asia, and happens to be one of the most sacred sites in all of Japan. The mountain is a cultural icon, and on a clear day, those busying themselves with work or home life in the capital of Tokyo are able to see the mountain's exceptionally symmetrical snow-capped peaks in the far distance. Mount Fuji is a regular fixture in art and photographs, being one of the most common scenes depicted on Japanese postcards thousands of which are sent all around the world from Japan each year. But on the northwestern side of Mount Fuji, set onto 30 square kilometers of hardened lava, lies a forest known as Akigahara. The Akigahara Forest, sometimes known as the Sea of Trees, can be extremely dense in places, with the porous lava rock red of the forest having properties which make it adept at absorbing sound waves. This can give visitors a sense of absolute solitude, making it a popular destination for other less savory activities such as hiking or camping. You see, the Akikahara has a historical reputation in Japan for being home of the Yurai, a name given to the ghosts of the dead in Japanese mythology. This is down to a number of reasons, but the most prevalent is the fact that the Akikahara is known quite bluntly as a forest in which people take their lives. Every year, scores of Japanese men and women venture into the forest to end their lives. These incidents have become too frequent over the past 50 years or so that Japanese authorities have placed signs at the head of some trails urging visitors to think of their families and to contact prevention hotlines. In 2003 alone, over 100 bodies were located in the Akigahara, an increase from the previous year's 78. During the year 2010, Japanese police noted that more than 200 people have attempted to end their lives in the forest, with just over 50 of them having completed the morbid act, undeterred by the many signs and warnings given to those who venture out there. Perhaps the most common method in the deep woods near Mount Fuji are overdoses or hanging, although many more creative methods have been observed by the annual body searches conducted by police, volunteers, and journalists. It is also morbidly interesting to note that the rate in which this happens in Japan increases during the month of March, being the end of the fiscal year for Japanese businesses and traders. So much so that in recent years, local officials have had a huge effort to stop publicizing the numbers and figures in an attempt to curb the Akigahara's popularity as a destination for this kind of act. 
The site's popularity has often been attributed to Saiko Matsumoto's 1961 novel Nami no To, known in English as The Tower of Waves. The novel is the story of a Japanese couple who, on discovering that fate has rendered it impossible for them to be together happy, take a trip into the deep woods near Mount Fuji, wherein they end their lives together. It is still considered one of the most romantic novels ever published on the Japanese market, but the blame for the deaths in the Akigahara cannot be placed squarely at the feet of Mr. Matsumoto. For there is another book, written by the author Wataru Surumi, that details the hardness of living in Japanese society. It is known as Kanzen Jusatsu Manyuraru, or The Complete Manual of Ending Your Life. First published on July 4th, 1993, the book went on to sell more than one million copies in the Japanese domestic literature market alone. In the postscript, Surumi says, To think that at the worst crucial moment one can escape from the pain by ending their own life, one can live for the moment easier. So by distributing this book, I want to make this stifling society an easier place to live in. This is the aim of this book and I never intend to encourage readers to end their own life. Although the book is quite clearly an instruction manual, the author explains his philosophy throughout in opposition to the social pressure to live strong. He details every method, rating different aspects of each technique, such as painfulness, gruesomeness of the body, probability of failure, and cost in event of failure. The fact that one can easily identify the least painful and easiest method of such is and was extremely controversial at the time of publication. However, the history of ending your own life in Akigahara predates both novels' publication and the place has long been associated with death. For example, there is a practice in Japan known as Ubatsute, which literally translates to abandoning an old woman whereby an infirm or elderly relative was carried to a mountain or some other remote desolate place and left there to die. Despite being an ancient or archaic practice, abandoning of the elderly was practiced in Japan well into the 19th century, long after other cultures had abandoned it in favor of the elongation of life, palliative care, or general comfort and respect for the elderly. It is this that primarily led Akigahara to be thought of as haunted by the yurai of those left to die there. However, despite local authorities' efforts to curtail interest in the forest, fairly recent events have brought public attention back towards it in a huge way. All thanks to a YouTuber by the name of Logan Paul, the Ohio native faced a huge online backlash over a YouTube video he posted during a visit to Japan one of which showed the body of apparently a victim of someone who took their own life. The vlog-style posts entailed Logan with his friends heading into the forest to film the so-called haunted woods. There they came across a man's body. It is clear that they were incredibly shocked by what they saw before them, with a couple of screenshots of Logan's expression being the mainstay of video thumbnails, but outrage was widespread when Paul and his accompaniment began to apparently make jokes, making light of an incredibly dark situation and inviting a torrent of criticism upon them. The identity of the deceased man is not known, and Paul's production team had taken the time to blur out the man's facial features. Online comments have called the Japan video, which garnered millions of views on YouTube before it was taken down, disrespectful and disgusting. Paul's channels were removed from YouTube's Google Preferred program, where brands sell ads on the platform's top 5% of content creators. YouTube also said it had put on hold original projects with a U.S. vlogger. On average, every year in Japan, more than 25,000 people take their own lives. That's 70 every single day, the vast majority being men. The grim self-immolation of a 71-year-old man aboard a Japanese bullet train in 2014 once again rammed the issue back into the headlines. As he tipped the liquid over himself, he is reported to have shooed away other passengers, telling them it was dangerous. What drove a quiet elderly man to douse himself with fuel and set fire to it in a packed carriage on a speeding train? Why do people choose life over death? They're questions that may well go unanswered for as long as there are human beings to ask them. And as long as there are, 
the Akigahara forest will still have those little colored ribbons for those souls not quite lost to find their way back. The scariest story I've ever heard was told to me by my grandfather. He was a soldier during the Second World War, enlisting on the day he turned 18 on March 3rd, 1944. The timing meant he missed the D-Day landings, as well as all the horrors associated with it, but he arrived on the Western Front just in time to take part in something arguably much worse, the invasion of the German homeland. Looking back, with the kind of 2020 vision that hindsight gives you, it seems obvious that Germany was destined to lose the war, squeezed under the combined weights of the Allied and Soviet armed forces. But in the moment, during the day-to-day -day fighting in the fields and forests of northern Europe, the future seemed anything but certain. In fact, Germany was still convinced it could win the war. Using atomic bomb technology, stubborn defensive tactics, or a combination of the two, the Germans were far from convinced that their fight was over. And it was into this new phase of the war that my grandfather found himself in during a nightmarish push into the German heartland that would prove just as terrifying as anything that had preceded it, if not more so. On the 2nd of October 1944, the Battle of Aachen began. The city had been incorporated into the Siegfried Line, the main defensive network on Germany's western border, and the Allies hoped to capture it quickly before advancing into the industrialized Ruhr Basin to land the knockout blow to German manufacturing capabilities. However, a few miles south of the city lay a place known as Hertgenwald, or Hertgen Forest. It was here that over 80,000 German soldiers were based, and the U.S. Army Task Force sent into the woods intended to pin them down and prevent them from reinforcing the city of Aachen. It's there that my grandfather's story occurs, so without further ado, this is what happened to him. He and his platoon had been tasked with a routine patrol through the woods, probing for the German defensive line on which they would call in artillery and air support. It has been a quiet morning, but that calm was shattered when a distant rifle shot sent one of his platoon mates crashing into the dirt. The soldiers tried to find what little cover they could but it took a few minutes before they could work out just which angle the shots were coming from. And in that time, three or four other Americans fell to that German sniper's bullets. A few men tried to tactically withdraw under covering fire from their fellow soldiers, but the sniper picked them off before they could get away. Before long, the entire platoon was pinned down by the sniper, completely unable to move without being shot down where they stood. But as horrendous as that sounds, that's not the part that stuck with them. It's what came next. The platoon's radio man had been the one shot during the initial ambush and had bled to death pretty quickly, lying lifeless in a slight clearing among the trees. Anytime any of the soldiers tried to pull the man's radio unit to safety, the sniper would let off a shot, ensuring they kept their distance. One brave soul actually managed to get a hand on the radio, but through obscene skill or just plain luck, the sniper managed to put a bullet through the upper section of the palm, basically blowing out his finger ligaments and rendering his hand useless. To their absolute horror, there was no way for any of them to call in artillery or air support. Effectively, more than 20 men were completely at the mercy of one German sniper. My grandfather told me that on numerous occasions a soldier might shift a little in place, maybe peek up to see if they could spot the sniper's firing position, and each time, the man would fall dead or scream out in pain as the bullet whizzed through the trees and found its mark, and each time the sniper fired and cut down another American in cold blood, he would laugh. He laughed so loud it would echo through the trees around them. My grandfather said that was the sound that he could never, ever forget. Hearing the joy in the German sniper's laugh, the raw, violent delight he felt when his bullet struck home, sometimes he would shout something, a phrase my grandfather couldn't understand but had translated later on, Mer Weinenda Kinder, more crying children. That sniper had my grandfather's platoon pinned down for about six full hours, but to him it felt like days. They had to just lie there, perfectly still as the dead, 
open eyes of their fallen comrades stared at them, looks of shock and horror on their lifeless faces. At one point, the sniper, unable to spy any living targets through his high-powered scope, began to fire upon the dead in an attempt to break the platoon psychologically. My grandfather told me the entire platoon winced in disgust and terror as a bullet smashed into a dead man's skull. He had bled out leaning up against a tree and was evidently still well within the sniper's sights. Of all the wounds and injuries my grandfather saw during the war, he told me head wounds were always the worst. Once the structural integrity of the human skull is compromised, be it by bullet or shrapnel, or from the blunt force of a rifle butt, a person's face changes shape. The first bullet that hit the dead man's skull practically split it in two, right down the middle. But nothing I can write will outdo the exact horrific manner in which my grandfather described it. I'd known that guy for months. I could recognize him in the dark, just from his gait. But now, I didn't recognize him at all. His eyes way too far apart. He looked... inhuman. But the sniper didn't stop there. He laughed and laughed and laughed as he sent two bullets, then three, then four sailing into the dead man's skull, pulverizing it until it was just a mess of broken bone and leaking brain matter. Eyeballs still connected by the optical nerve dangled from shattered eye sockets. I can't even imagine how traumatic that must have been for a kid who was barely 18 years old. I mean, he was still a kid. A child. I think back to when I was 18, I could barely handle seeing a paper cut, let alone seeing someone's entire head explode. His platoon had to wait until nightfall to escape. They did so as barks of Feiglinger, Feiglinger echoed through the trees. Cowards, cowards, the German sniper called them, in between volleys of that perverted, manic laughter. My grandpa said that he still expected to be shot as they ran back the way they came, trying not to have head-on collisions with tree trunks as they did. One man was so terrified he actually did run straight into a tree, broke his nose, but just got up and kept running. Grandpa died last year, so I consider this a little tribute to a great man who went through terrible times. Rest in peace, Grandpa. Every summer for the past few years, a group of friends and I have traveled from our homes in Liverpool in the UK to Dumfries and Galloway in Scotland. Dumfries and Galloway is home to the largest continuous forest in the whole of the United Kingdom, Galloway Forest Park. It's about as wild as it gets for the UK, with some parts of the woods being so dense and overgrown that it's clear no one has stepped foot in them for hundreds, possibly thousands of years. Our yearly visits brought us peace, clarity, and a respect for nature, but last year's trip ended in one of the most horrifying and distressing incidents of my entire life. One that completely changed the way I see the world and the way I consider the human mind. Year in, year out, we take an overnight coach up across the border, then hike out to a place called Loch Aber. The lock is a private fishing lake supposedly reserved for members of a local fishing club who ensure that the waters are chock full of fish for them to catch, which makes it oh so easy for us to pull a quick in and out raid to catch enough of the small ruffle fish for our dinner. I'm serious. 45 minutes and we're golden. And take it from any fisherman, that is lightning speed for a half decent catch. But last year we decided we were tired of the same old digs and set our gazes further afield. A map told us that there was a similarly deep lock about 30 miles east known as Loch D. We figured it would be a perfect fishing spot and we were right. Sure it wasn't as quick fire as the private member's lake but it came with considerably less guilt. Everything was going perfect. That was until the second night when, in the middle of a campfire drinking session, one of my buddies jumped out of his seat and recoiled from the fire. Who was that? He asked, sort of calmly at first, nothing more than cautious confusion. Who's who? Someone replies lazily. Someone moving through the trees back there. 
He was pointing into the trees directly behind my back. I actually gave a hoot of sarcastic laughter at first, thinking he was just trying to scare us. But the moment it became obvious that he wasn't messing around, a jolt of fear went through me and I too leapt out of my seat, spun around and shone my torch into the darkness. You could feel the tension among us rising as we desperately looked around for who he might have been talking about. Torch beams darted across the trees, inspecting every trunk or thicket of bushes, but there was nothing. No sign of the person my friend had seen. Hello? Someone called out, immediately shushed by the rest of us. No one wanted to give away our position, but at the same time, we needed to know if there was anyone out there watching us. But again, nothing. Just silence. I think you've had a bit too much to drink, mate. I remember saying to the guy who supposedly seen a figure walking through the trees, I'm fine. I barely touched that bells I bought. I swear to God I saw someone just then. Like who? Someone asked. Man, woman, young, old, what? I... I don't know, he replied shakily, but they were really, really big. Only big thing around here is your bloody imagination, mate. Now go and get your head down, it's been a long day. And it had, thanks to the overnight coach. No one really sleeps on the journey up to Scotland. I mean, they close their eyes, put some chill music through their earphones, but they never really sleep so everyone ends up being pretty wrecked by the end of the first night. The next morning, we felt even worse. The first night after such a long journey is usually the one where we sleep like the dead, but not that night. None of us could quite relax, not with the possibility of having someone stalking us in the back of our minds. Thank God we were only planning to fish that day, as we really were not in the mood for anything else, given how bloody exhausted we were. After breakfast, we marched down to the lock with our fishing gear. It's a gorgeous area, a crisp blue lake ringed by hills. It's not unusual to get some really nice sunny days up in Scotland too, especially during the summer. But that day, the sky was this horrible, grimy gray, like the sun had barely risen at all. I was tired, half soaked from the drizzle, barely even excited to be fishing for my dinner. I actually hoped for something exciting to happen, and for my sins, my wish came true. Look, one of us shouted. Over there, other side of the lock. Jesus, can you see that thing? It was the same lad that had seen someone or something walking through the trees. Where? We were terrified. One sighting could have been his eyes playing tricks on him. Another couldn't possibly be a mistake. There! He said, pointing. Just on the other side. It came out of the trees for a moment, then disappeared. Please tell me you saw that. Mate, just calm down. It's probably just... I know what I saw. And we need to get out of these bloody woods right now. He said, grabbing up his fishing gear in a panic. I remember him rushing off back to the camp. One of the lads following him, still trying to calm him down. But it was impossible. He was manic, scared half to death by whatever had briefly emerged from the woods on the other side of the lock. I asked the other boys if they had seen anything. They each shook their heads. None of us had any idea what he was talking about. But that didn't mean they weren't just as freaked out over his outburst. We were supposed to stay for seven full nights, but that second one was our last. We'd managed to talk the lad who was panicking down. Convince him to stay a few nights more at the very least. We come all this way and I wasn't about to let one of us just leave because they had a wee scare or something. But it didn't end there either. In the middle of the night, the lad that had been seeing something burst out of his tent, waking each of us before asking, Can you hear that? There was silence. Dead silence. I mean, I strained my ears trying to hear what had him so spooked. But I heard nothing just the rustling of a few sleeping bags as confused blokes sat up awake. He was scratching at his own ears, gritting his teeth, rocking back and forth in the dirt as the sound seemed to completely overwhelm him. That's the exact moment I realized 
I think the same moment everyone else picked up on it too, but there was no noise. There was no monster. It was all in his head. He was experiencing a psychotic breakdown, and it was literally all in his head. My name is Amber and I live here in Asheville, North Carolina with my dog, Captain. Captain is the love of my life. He's an Alaskan Kleekai Husky with a mostly black coat, but with streaks of white fur around his legs and face. Not to mention little rings of dark fur around his pale blue eyes that make him look like the Hamburglar. I rescued him from a shelter when he was just a puppy, right after my fiancé moved out to Hong Kong for work. He helped me through the initial loneliness on nights when I just couldn't handle getting into an empty bed for the 50th time, and in the years that followed when my husband decided he would be better off starting a family with a Chinese woman he met through his job, Captain helped me through the heartbreak. Captain is a big guy, a subwoofer. While other dogs need walks, Captain needs hikes, which is why every weekend for the past few years, I would drive him out to Nantahala National Forest, one of the few places he could really be. Dogs just aren't meant to be cooped up indoors. They need to run, they need to explore, they need a place like Nantahala. And coincidentally, so did I. It was a place I could really lose myself, a place to escape the pressures of a high-pressure, high-paying job. The woods were a place of sanctuary to me, but... That all changed one chilly October day when I came to realize that there is a good reason why human beings have walled themselves off in towns and cities, because the wilderness, it seems, is not our friend. Captain was always his happiest in the woods. For such a majestic animal, he has an uncanny ability to act goofy, and the woods brought that out of him in spades. He'd be so lost in the feeling of pure freedom, his blue eyes all wide with his tongue lolling out one side of his mouth, riding the waves of zoomies that inevitably had me laughing at how dorky he acted. So you can imagine how quickly I noticed a change in his behavior. How he went from such a loud, boisterous dog to a quivering, whiny wreck that barely ventured a few feet away from me at any one time. And all the time I'd been taking Captain out to Nantahala, I'd never seen him act in such a way. And when I laid a hand on his neck to give him a stroke, I discovered he was actually trembling in fear. My first thought was that a mountain lion could have been in the area, but a previous encounter with what I'd figured was a predator's scent trail had caused Captain to bark incessantly and become overly aggressive. Now that was back in the fall of last year, and that the previous summer the Nantahala had seen a sharp increase in black bear activity with homeowners being encouraged to be much more careful surrounding issues of food disposal. It was entirely possible that Captain had sniffed out a mama bear and cubs, and in which case he was right to be cautious. But he wasn't just cautious, he was outright terrified. I had no idea what to make of such a situation, but one thing was clear. Captain wanted out, and consequently so did I. There was only one big problem with such a plan. We'd already spent like two hours hiking into the woods. Getting out would be not quick or easy. With every step, the tension grew. Captain looking behind me with wild, terrified eyes, darting ahead before doubling back to whine at me. Each footstep seemed a little quicker than the last. My utter paranoia growing to fever pitch as I continually looked behind me and continually saw nothing. But something was behind us. Captain knew it and I could feel it. At one point, he bounded back to my side and froze, staring off into the dense forest as he sniffed at the air before him. I thought the worst was over, but I was horribly, horribly wrong. With a yelp so loud it hurt my ears, he burst off through the trees ahead, howling barks punctuating his canine gallop. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the trees behind me, and with a terror so rampant I can still feel it to this day, I heard something behind me, breathing, and it was huge. I just ran, 
following the sound of Captain's barks crashing through the dense trees as dry branches tore at the bare skin of my face. There are many times in my life where I'd been uncomfortable, anxious, or scared. This experience dwarfed them all. No emotion can compare to that of knowing you're being hunted by something, something you cannot reason or bargain with, something that will crunch your bones into meal and not feel a freaking thing. I ran harder and longer than I ever have in my life, so intensely that when I finally had to stop to draw breath, I found myself dry retching against a tree trunk out of exhaustion, out of fear, out of pure biological imperative making me as light and mobile as possible. But there could be no respite. Captain's furious barks made that abundantly clear. We had to keep moving. It was that or be eaten alive. With tears in my eyes, I carried on running, hurtling through the forest, the thicket so dense I was running half-blind, which was made painfully obvious when I caught my foot on a fallen tree trunk and was sent flying into the dirt. The impact knocked the wind out of me with an ugly grunt, and as I rolled onto my back, struggling for breath, I saw Captain appear at my side. He had been my hero so many times before and wasn't about to fail me now. His barks were wild, full of rage, his sharp teeth exposed as he poured the raw force of his being into the woods behind us. It was terrifying, awe-inspiring to behold, and in that moment, I thanked God that he was on my side. But not even Captain could maintain the display, for when the unseen thing hunting us seemed to roar back through the trees, Captain was silenced. He rushed over to me, taking the collar of my waterproof coat between his teeth and trying to drag me along the forest floor. But I was renewed by terror, by biological imperative, by the raw need to survive. In an instant, I was back on my feet, running, panting, scrambling for life. I remember there being a moment when I was terrified that Captain might leave me, how the fear might prove too much for him to handle. There was so much of a force for him to escape into, but he never once failed to double back and find me. Even when he was out of sight, he made sure to continue barking furiously so I'd know exactly where to run to. That was until I burst through a set of particularly thick bushes to find Captain stood stationary at a riverbank. It wasn't all that wide or all that deep but it was enough of an obstacle to halt his progress. You see, Captain hated water. I don't know if it was something that happened to him as a puppy before we adopted him from the shelter, but Captain has always hated it. Pools, rivers, lakes, you couldn't get him to go within six feet of them, which is why seeing that river in our way terrified me on a whole new level. Out of pure instinct, I just jumped across. Like I said, it wasn't particularly wide, but the exhaustion of running for so long meant uh, I only barely made the jump. I turned, knowing that Captain wouldn't even attempt to jump without encouragement or direction. My voice was trembling as I spoke. Come on, boy. Jump to mama. Please, boy. Please. Jump to mama. It was horrendous. Watching his eyes so full of confusion, saying without words, why are you making me do this? I watched him pacing up and down the bank as the thing hunting us grew closer and closer. In the end, I was begging him, pleading with him, promising steak dinners for an entire year if he would only get himself across that river. For a moment, he froze, sizing up the gap before sprinting off back among the trees. Again, that terrified feeling gripped me. He couldn't do it. He was so terrified of the water that, in a moment of pure panic, he fled back in the direction of the thing chasing us. It felt like an eternity, standing there on the riverbank, praying that he'd reappear, somehow convincing myself that he wouldn't. Only, he did. In one glorious moment, he burst from the foliage, hurtling towards the river's edge at breakneck speed. As he reached the bank, his legs unfurled like springs, sending him sailing through the air, high above the river. It's funny the little details you remember from a traumatic event, and even one of the things that sticks with me are Captain's eyes as he jumped that river. They were huge, these massive pale blue circles that seemed to shine out from the rings of black fur around them, almost like he couldn't quite believe what he was doing, and quite frankly, neither could I. 
I mean it when I say he was like an action hero in some hyperbolic 80s movie. The bravery he displayed is something I feel I can only aspire to. Even his landing was dramatic. He barely made it across and was scrambling up the dirt embankment when I leapt towards him, grabbed him by the collar, and pulled him up onto solid ground. When we were up, he took off again with renewed speed, seemingly more terrified of the water than would have been stalking us. I'd had tears in my eyes before, but at that moment I broke down completely, calling after him with staggered breathing. Good boy, Captain. Good boy. I continued to run, feeling my thighs burn and my feet ache from what felt like miles upon miles. I was so short of breath, so exhausted, I thought I might just pass out at any moment. When I say I could literally hear my own heart beating in my throat, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest. I am not an unfit person either. I dance a lot, take a spin class, I have stamina. But running at almost constant sprint for the better part of an hour made it feel like my heart was about to explode on my chest. By the time I reached the peak of yet another gentle incline, my legs gave out from under me. I remember seeing silvery white patches appearing in my vision, and no matter how hard I drew breath, I just couldn't seem to get enough oxygen. When I saw something moving in front of me, something that definitely wasn't Captain, I thought that was it. I thought I'd pass out and never wake up again, having been torn apart by whatever wild animal was chasing us. I woke up in the back seat of a four-seater pickup truck. As soon as I found the strength to sit up, I heard a voice outside the stationary vehicle shout, Hey, she's awake! Suddenly the door opened and a person I'd never seen before in my life was offering me a plastic bottle of water and asking if I was okay. I didn't speak. I just took the water off of him and gulped like three quarters of it down in one long sweet chug. By the time I regained my senses, I was panicking. I couldn't see Captain anywhere. I looked at the stranger, dressed in his hunting gear, and tried to summon the strength to ask him where my dog was. Although the words just wouldn't come out, the look on my face must have told him all he needed to know. When he told me Captain was fine, and he was just inside their hunting lodge getting a bite to eat, I just cried with relief. I was so overjoyed he was okay, but that's not what made me burst into tears. The hunter told me that, for a while, Captain wouldn't follow any of them out of the truck, no matter how much meat they offered him. He just stayed at my side, yapping and whining, waiting for me to wake up. For a couple of hours, I joined the hunters in their lodge, eating the hamburger they offered me slowly while I regained my strength. I told them exactly what had happened, how Captain had freaked out after we stumbled across what I assumed was a black bear, but black bears are relatively small, certainly not as big as grizzlies and certainly not as big as whatever had been chasing us through the woods. I raised the issue with them and asked them what they thought it might be. I thought they might have an answer being seasoned hunters, but they didn't. There was this awkward silence as they exchanged looks before one of them spoke up, telling me they just didn't know. I asked if it was possible that a grizzly bear could make it this far down from the Rockies, with one responding that was possible. But that was a lie, an outright lie. Those hunters quite possibly saved my life, and for that I will be eternally grateful. But I know they lied to me. Grizzlies don't make it anywhere near North Carolina at any time of the year. I've done a fair amount of research into what was chasing that day, but... I've been unable to come up with anything conclusive. The only thing I know for sure is that those hunters were hiding something and as long as they do, people will continue to go missing in that stretch of North Carolina woodland. Captain is lying next to my computer chair as I write this, ever faithful, ever watching, and in my darkest moments, I wonder however I'm going to last without him. I feel like what I'm about to read is a warning. I beg you, I implore you, please do not go hiking in the woods around Pittsfield, Massachusetts. I know those woods like the back of my hand, 
I was playing with my little brother among those trees when I was still in single-digit ages. So trust me when I say that something has been changing out there and not for the better. I first noticed something was horribly wrong during a hike a few weeks back. In the early spring, birds migrate back from the warmer southern climates to their northern territories in mass. Thousands upon thousands of tiny songbirds occupy the trees around Mount Greylock during the month of March, each singing a sweet, chirpy song that is in reality a bellowed war cry, a call for challengers to step up and knock them off their perch. Yet as I trudged through the previous winter's leaf litter, I couldn't hear a single thing. No birds, or any other animals for that matter, seemed to still call the forest home. This made me nervous for two reasons. One, animals have an uncanny ability to detect danger that are imperceptible to humans. Their sense of smell, hearing, and general atmospherics are far superior to our own. If the wildlife had fled the area in such a hurry, or at least refused to return, that could mean something awful was about to happen. And two, areas of woodland turn exceptionally quiet when there is a large predator around. Wood pigeons will become deathly quiet and still, hoping a black bear or mountain lion would just pass them by. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but either way it would be hideously unsafe of me to wander around while one was prowling the area. So naturally I started making my way back towards my car when something real peculiar happened. I feel I should remind you at this point that I've been playing in the woods around Mount Greylock since I was like 7 or 8 years old. It's pretty far from where our family lived when I was a kid, but thanks to our bikes, we had a pretty large area to roam when it came to those long summer breaks. Point being, I know those woods really well, but some way, somehow, I managed to get lost. It first came to my attention that I managed to get myself turned around when I felt my head begin to throb with a dull ache. I stopped walking for a moment, rubbing my eyes and the bridge of my nose to try and massage away the headache. But when I opened my eyes again and looked around, I felt a faint flash of panic running through me. I didn't recognize my surroundings, and I cannot understate how jarring that was for me, to be somewhere I'd been visiting all my life only for it to feel utterly foreign to me. I actually had to take a moment to take out my compass just to try and get a bearing of where I was headed. But to my surprise, the compass needle kept slowly moving around. Even when I got it to sit still on a supposed bearing, it slowly began creeping around again. Now this was much less of a problem than it might appear. Sure, it was unnerving, but there are ways around a faulty compass. Like for one, moss mostly grows on the north side of a tree a side that gets the most sunlight, so that provides an easy way of determining which way was north. At least, it usually would. Because as I inspected various tree trunks, I realized the sun was hanging in the southern portion of the sky. That or the moss in this area grew mostly on the southern section of the tree trunks. I get that it's not entirely out of the question, but that was yet another detail that just seemed to fry my brain. Nothing made sense, and the less it did, the more the feeling of pure panic began to bubble in my chest. But the panic in that situation, in any kind of situation, is to welcome defeat, degradation, and death. I kept myself calm, told myself there was a rational explanation for everything that was occurring, and walked off in the direction I was almost sure the nearest highway was. It was... Then I came across something I'd never, ever seen in those woods before. Something that seemed so out of place that it was frankly terrifying. In all the years I'd spent roaming those woods with my brother as a kid, I'd never seen anything like the old run-down cabin that stood before me. And I mean it was old. As in, there was no way it could have been built any later than like 1979. So just how me and my brother had missed this place was utterly beyond me. The obvious thing to do was to knock on the cabin door, see if anybody was home, and, as much as I might find it humiliating, ask for directions. 
but as I walked closer and closer towards the rustic front door, I felt the most unusual sensation. I put it down to general tiredness, maybe my blood sugar was low, I'm not entirely sure, but for whatever reason, each footstep that took me closer to the cabin seemed more and more difficult. By the time I was actually bringing a closed fist to knock on that old wooden door, it felt like something was physically repelling me from it, whispering directly into my brain, leave this place and never return, don't look back, never look back. When I finally knocked, the door creaked open slightly, revealing the dilapidation behind it. Whatever bolts or locks that were on the door had long since worn away, and the inside was just as run down and rotten as the outside was. It was evidently abandoned, but there was a curious order to the furniture that led me to believe that, every so often, the cabin did actually receive some visitors aside from me. But something in the corner of the cabin drew my attention. I then saw what it was. What I'm about to attempt to describe is, quite frankly, indescribable. I know it was a wooden idol of some kind. A small statuette set atop of a stone altar. But, and I appreciate that this is intensely confusing to read, I could not make sense of what I was looking at. It was like my brain was completely incapable of computing the information my eyes were feeding it. And with that, my headache returned again, along with a kind of anxiety so crushing that I felt like I was going to have a panic attack. Don't ask me how I know, but that wooden idol, a mess of twigs and vines and moss, was a representation of pure, unfiltered evil. And I ran from it. I'm not in the least bit ashamed to admit that I ran like a scared child from that cabin and into the night. The night. You read that right. When I walked into that cabin, it was still daylight. I couldn't have been there for more than a couple of minutes at least, and that's what it felt like. Only when I burst through the wooden door, it was pitch black outside. I ran until I found the highway, ran until I found my car, and I drove like a madman until I was completely back at home. I haven't been able to bring myself to talk about what happened to me that day until now. I tried to tell a hunting buddy of mine once, but the words just wouldn't seem to come out. But please, heed my warning. And don't go hiking in the woods around Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to tuck Alex in for the night.